So I'm Pat Hostetter Martin, um, and I'd like to introduce uh, the two people that will be speaking this morning. Um, Kevin King is the executive director of uh, Mennonite Disaster Service. Kevin was born in Cochranville in Chester County, Pennsylvania. Uh, he, he grew up in a potato and dairy farm along with five brothers, no sisters. Uh, he graduated from Eastern Mennonite University in 1981 and then went to Brazil with MCC. <coughs> Came home and married Karen Stolz from Tennessee, is that right? From Tennessee. Um, and together they went uh, with MCC to Jamaica um, where their first son, Justin King, was born. Justin is now principal at Eastern Mennonite School uh, and later a daughter. Uh, back in Pennsylvania, who now teaches at uh, Bluestone Elementary School. And for the past 16 years, uh, Kevin has been the Executive Director of Mennonite Disaster Service. Johan Zimmerman uh, was born in Paraguay uh, in a Bruderhof community that had fled Germany in 1934. Um, his family of 11 children eventually came to a Bruderhof community in New York um, Johan left that community to go to school, go to university. He graduated from Cornell in 1978 with a BS in civil engineering. Um, in 1983, he married Sue Clausen, a Mennonite brethren woman from Fresno, California, who was born in Brazil. Sue and Johan have uh, two adult children, Tabea and Jonas. Uh, over the years, Johan and Sue have worked with MCC in Mozambique, Burkina Faso, Nicaragua, and Washington, D.C. Uh, they moved to Harrisonburg in 2004, where Johan started, a, uh, started working as a structural engineer and eventually started his own company called JZ Engineering, which you've probably seen uh, their logo around. Over the past four years, uh, Johan has been working with MDS to design, to design and rebuild bridges in West Virginia. And there was a little, um, uh, some, some uh, uh, pictures of that. Um, these are small little bridges that are built over creeks that when there's storms, uh, many of them have been washed out. And those bridges essentially connect people with uh, roads and schools and churches and uh, grocery stores, neighbors. And over the past four years, uh, Johan has helped to design 100 of these bridges, these little bridges, uh, with M MDS. And he and his fellow engineers have built over 70 of, of bridges like that. Since uh, two, uh, 2017, when Hurricane Maria devastated Puerto Rico, Johan has made eight trips to Puerto Rico with MDS. During his last four, year, four trips, um, Johannes was training FEMA and local volunteers in how to build hurricane resistant bridges. So let's welcome these two men to us this morning. Good morning. What a great group to be with this morning. Uh, my name is Kevin King. Thank you, Pat. What Pat did not say in her introduction is, it seems to be that wherever I go, there's a disaster. <laughs> when I went to Brazil to help start a farming cooperative, it turned into a, well, it was a five-year drought. So my work turned into water relief and dams and wells and building cisterns. When my wife and I went to Jamaica with Mennonite Central Committee, Six months we were to work with a rural farming community up in the highlands of Santa Cruz uh, near the Deaf School, which many of you are familiar with, Maranatha School for the Deaf. Six months into our term there, Hurricane Gilbert hit September 12th, 1988, and changed my role into disaster response, building, rebuilding homes with the Jamaica Mennonite Church pastors. So I often say, you don't want me to come to your town. 
But here we are. Here are these words from the psalmist in Psalms 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Often when this verse just comes out of these communities riddled by disasters, it's the most oft-quoted verse by pastors. And they often say, this verse now has a whole new meaning. A whole new meaning. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. What does it mean to be a refuge and a fortress? Certainly, I believe, for Mennonite Disaster Service, a volunteer network of Anabaptist churches throughout the U.S. and Canada, where we are invited or we enter into a community to respond, rebuild, and restore. And in that practice of restoring faith, hope, and wholeness, amazing things happen. So this morning, we want to tell stories, we want to give a, a bit of background. Most of our conversations will be focusing on Puerto Rico, and um, some of you are much more experts in Puerto Rico than I am because our, our history goes deep into Puerto Rico, the Mennonite church there. And so then I'll hope to share the next 15-20 uh, minutes and give a general overview of what happened in the hurricane. And then uh, Johan will do a deep dive as to what are we specifically doing. Then I want to open it up for questions at the end. So please, uh, I relish that and look forward to that time. A little bit about uh, Puerto Rico. It's important to know that Mennonites arrived on the island in 1946 as COs, or 1W. They went down there as, in a 1W program. How many of you have relatives or aunts or uncles that served in Puerto Rico? Anyone? Oh my, look at that. Puerto Rico was, was very formative for our young people. And it was very formative for Puerto Rico. Wherever I travel in, in Puerto Rico, the name Mennonite is almost revered. Uh, because of the hospital systems, because of the agriculture, because of the churches planted. And so it's amazing uh, wherever I travel, the impact that this has done. And I think the impact as well on our people here on the mainland stays up. Well, let's dive into this. I'll give a quick little uh, PowerPoint overview. Turn it on. There we go. Um, it's important also to note that there are presently three conferences in Puerto Rico. How many churches, just call it out, how many churches do you think Mennonite churches exist in Puerto Rico? Anyone want to guess? 20. 20. Very close. 21. Good guess. Free t-shirt for you. Um, so Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico. Uh, almost this week, two years ago. And the first to arrive on the ground was Larry Stoner. He arrived there in September 26. He was able to finally get a plane ticket into, and was received by Rolando Flores, who is the MCC worker there on the ground. And uh, Rolando also is the pastor at Summer Hills Mennonite Church and is on staff with Mennonite Central Committee. So our initial response included cash donations to pastors, electrical generators for the churches, canned meat, tarps, chainsaws, flashlights, and so on. And so our initial response, of course, was that early response of cleanup, getting the homes and churches safe, sound, and secure. It was a flurry of activity, uh, tremendous, as in right after disasters, it's very chaotic. And uh, it's often trying to manage and coordinate and communicate, collaborate, and cooperate, as we often say, after disaster. 
I thought it would be helpful just to read a little bit of my first trip report because I arrived in October the 3rd. I wrote this. I don't remember planning for a trip that took so much planning and concern if one would even make it to, on, the, on the plane. Purchasing supplies, arranging cash to take along, concerns about overweight luggage. I woke up to him in the morning and couldn't sleep anymore. At four o'clock, a friend of mine took me to Philadelphia and we started our trip to Puerto Rico. I was joined at the airport with Elizabeth Soto. She was born in Puerto Rico and is a current professor at Lancaster Theological Center. We met there at the airport and Phil Troyer, our Region 1 director, was to accompany us, but his flight was canceled. So there he had all his luggage and we had to take his luggage as well. And I was like, how is this going to happen? I got to the ticket counter at Southwest Airlines and she said, where are you going with all that? And I said, San Juan. All that? I said, yes. She said, we're not having this conversation. And she just passed it all through and didn't charge anything. So I knew we were off to a good start. Well, we landed there and it was chaotic in the airport with no electricity and the cell phones weren't working and it was tough to meet up with Rolando Flores and Larry Stoner on the ground already. But we soon uh, made up and we found our rental car. I wrote, President Trump was on the island and traffic was hampered by his presence. We made our way to the Joint Field Office. The Joint Field Office, or JFO, is where the federal government and the state combine and put their offices, temporary offices, in one big convention center. So it's about 20 times the size of this room, about 400 people, and they divide up the room with you know, emergency, uh, sanitation, education, roads, housing, shelter, on and on and on, different departments within FEMA. We made our way and we found our section to the housing area, and soon it was embarrassing. The Mennonites are here, the Mennonites are here, was the word from FEMA officials. Oh dear, sometimes our reputation precedes us and we, it's hard to manage the expectations as well. But the connections and the networking is just amazing. Let me just say a word about that. In Puerto Rico, it wasn't about just MDS going and hanging our shingle up and saying we're here to respond to the disasters. We wanted to coordinate also with Mennonite Health Services, with the MEA, Mennonite Education Association. MCC was there with a the footprint. So it's coordinating as well, not only with our volunteers and our donors and the press, but it's also coordinating with this, the M&Ms, what I often call, is coordinating and, and, and finding what are the value, what's the best that each of us can do. And so it's an overwhelming a gift. MDS and the Mennonite Anabaptists are blessed. I want you to hear that. We are small in number when we compare it to Salvation Army, Red Cross, Methodists, Presbyterians, and yet the cohesion and the coordination among our churches and our networking, I stand back so often amazed at the resources among our constituents. It's a beautiful thing. And often I get to see the joy of the gifts coming out of the church in that matter. And so we need to celebrate that. Okay, where was I? Well, our first goal was to make our way around to as many Mennonite churches as possible. And we couldn't communicate them that we were coming. So suddenly, here we show up in our SUV loaded with MCC canned meat and suitcases of water and food and tarps to drive up to a pastor's house, if it was there, or remnants of it. And there they're sitting on the, in, the, in, the, in the veranda, and suddenly we drive up. There is much tears and rejoicing and hugs. Uh, I can't explain it. Unexpectedly, one of the gifts that I put in my suitcase last minute was flashlights. 
thanks to Paul B. Zimmerman's effort. Uh, but uh, these mag lights with long power LED lights and to hand out a flashlight to a pastor with extra batteries was a gift of gold. Oh, says the pastor, I can't read, I, my candles and the kerosene is all gone. Now I can read my Bible or early in the morning or something. It was a way of connecting and to tell them that the churches are praying for you back here in the States was a powerful, powerful expression and a moment of solidarity. As we would leave, we'd pray and share some scripture and let them know that we'll be in contact that MDS is here on the island and help them rebuild. And then Rolando would quietly slip them an envelope of cash, four or $500 in small bills. For you see, the churches weren't meeting anymore. The offering plate wasn't being passed around. These pastors had no income. And so that also was very important. I better stay on the script. <laughs> right, Johan? Um, we're going to skip a little video. That gives a sense of the island and the different, what do you call these provinces or municipalities? Johan? Municipalities. The purple is uh, are the churches that are within, uh, this is a mission Caribe, the Caribbean mission conference, the smaller one. The larger conference is the Puerto Rico Mennonite Conference. And most people, uh, I Bonito to, is one of the municipalities. This is where Mennonites first landed in La Plata in 1946. And then the church grew out of that through health and agriculture and hospitals. And so most of the, the Puerto Rican Mennonite conference churches are in this area, 12 churches. I believe there are six or so or more, I may have the numbers wrong, but uh, the churches, and then on the western part of the island are more of the conservative conference. We dealt mostly with the churches uh, in the Puerto Rico Mennonite and the Mission, Caribbean Mission Churches uh, Conference. Um, so as we went, made our way around, did an assessment that first trip, learning which churches were torn down and needed assistance. I uh, talked about the donations. Uh, another thing that we worked with was uh, the STAR program and also did some, we gathered the pastors together soon after the hurricane for a weekend conference at a hotel with their spouses. Just have a time to lean on each other and cry and pray and worship and sing. This is often so, so very critical to normalize these expressions of fear or anger or disappointment. We even paid for a uh, person to come in and give massages and uh, just a grief counseling and so on because these pastors not only lost many of their own homes but their churches and yet they're supposed to be strong also for the community. And we'll be talking about here another area we work with is construction. How do we build back strong? Of course, your alumni, Johan will talk about that. Getting vehicles and tools on the island that was pretty well destroyed was quite a challenge, but we had to get vehicles there to, district, to move, make our way around. As I said early on, we did uh, distributing water and tarps, sending containers of the canned meat. The Atlantic Coast Conference in Pennsylvania, we put together a food parcel packet that uh, that was a goodwill gesture as well for many of the congregants to distribute to their churches. Canned meat. Um, of the four churches, this one yet has yet to be rebuilt. This is in Vega Baja of the Caribbean Mission there on the north coast of Puerto Rico. This is the Mano de Cielo de Vega Baja. So the only thing that survived of this church was the one end was this concrete wall and the rest was destroyed. Um, Puerto Rico, the worship, as you might say, is vibrant and uh, they love their music. So the neighbors start complaining, by the way, of the, the noise coming out of this church. So they opened up their walls and they put in egg cartons they create cartons to kind of dampen the sound. But that didn't do anything to hold up the structure. <laughs> uh, they're hoping to rebuild this footprint. The plans are coming in at a cost of around 
50,000. So MDS is raising funds for this. I think we have about 40,000 in hand, and we have 110 to go. One of the key things that we said about Puerto Rico is that we will utilize local labor as much as possible. Prior to the hurricane, the year before, over 80,000 people had left. 137 public schools closed down on the island. This was prior to the hurricane. Um, just the, the, the brain drain of people leaving, it was $80 billion in arrears before the hurricane. So Hurricane Maria was a way that kind of stripped the leaves off the trees and exposed the island for their vulnerability. As we continued around, we made visits to the different churches and the pastors and the different levels of damage, talking to their, um, talking, this is the church, I, the house that you'll be working on, I think, next week, right, Johan? I don't know if you'll say anything about this or not. Some of these cases are lingering on. These people are longing, longing to get back home. We also worked with the schools, the Bethany Mennonite Academy, Academy of Mennonite Batania, on the outskirts of Ibonito. They lost the roof of their music hall. So MDS, thanks to Johan's engineering, we put the roof back on. Anyone who was there, and how many of you been to Bethany? But the, uh, uh, Bethany Mennonite Academy, a uh, uh, major school there. Now the roof is back on. We're excited about that as well. We worked on many other homes. The roofing continues to be a job that we're working in Puerto Rico for the next uh, two years or years or more. We'll be there. Nilda's home, this was one of the first towns. Her house was on four by fours. It was about 500 square feet. And it was, this was all that remained of it. Uh, we decided to rebuild it back and build our first concrete home. And so the Merch family, are John and Jennifer Merch here? Thanks to the community support of the Community Mennonite Church, sponsored them to go, and they served with their three children for over three months, I believe it was. Amazing, amazing work there in Ponce area, alongside Demetrio Flores, Rolando's brother. So the, the, the gifts that also came out of the Puerto Rico Mennonite Church was just amazing. Not all of the reconstruction was done by volunteers. We, as I said, we hired local labor, another pastor's home, built by a private contractor, and MDS provided the funding. Or here's another home that we provided uh, funds for to be rebuilt, and this is the final, final product. Um, on and on, some people just needed their roofs sealed, and others needed to complete reconstruction. An area that we're working is on the southern, southwestern part of the island in Ponce, near a, a, a uh, municipal landfill where housing is very substandard, and so we're there rebuilding as well. Of course, Engineer Zimmerman, this is, this is uh, Elizabeth Soto's language, I guess, for Johan, but he's there inspecting many, many homes for us, and we move on. In my, I'd like to just end with a story and that is uh, Miguel's house in Ponce. This is Miguel's house. It was uh, put together by scrap plywood and tin. And you can imagine it didn't do, do too well in the hurricane. Miguel had, a, I think, an accident early on in his life, and he's in a wheelchair. And he became very depressed and took to drinking and alcohol and other vices. And so the community, the church, local Mennonite church said, we need to reach out to Miguel and build him a new home. So Johan went in and uh, drew up plans and volunteers. Also, by the way, Puerto Rico is on a seismic zone. We have to be mindful when we build back that there could be an earthquake someday. So not only to withstand 30 hours of the hurricane, that Hurricane Maria was a Category 4 for 30 hours. Not only do I have to design a home to withstand that wind load, 
but a seismic load. So we designed him a house and volunteers over the weeks and weeks. Oh, by the way, he did not want to move off this property, so they put together a little shack where he slept in and watched our volunteers from his wheelchair every day. This is the final product. Miguel is, has been transformed. In fact, there are days when I visited him, the wheelchair was in the back of his lot. He was able to walk. In fact, he has given his heart to the Lord and is attending the church, the local Mennonite church. And if you see, you can't quite hardly see there, but he insisted on taking the logo off of the MDS truck and he put it on his house. <laughs> quit smoking and he has above his house no fumar. This is a man who has literally it has transformed his life. One day he called he, uh, Demetrio, one of the brothers that attends the local Mennonite church, said, yeah, he called me early in the morning. He said, come get me. Well, the church isn't starting yet. Yeah, but I want to make a big pot of vegetable soup and I want everybody from the church to come back to my house and have vegetable soup after church. MDS, as we often say, is more than just building houses, it's rebuilding lives, one at a time. Thanks be to God. Johan, I'll give this to you. And a lot of you are part of this team. Um, MDS is something really special, and Kevin brought this up um, as well. First of all, there's thousands of people that volunteer with MDS, and the experience and expertise that comes from that is, is truly amazing. Um, it's been MDS that has supported our work, whether it's been bridges in West Virginia or in Puerto Rico, otherwise we would not, not have been able to do that. And that has put us in contact with so many different people who have given their expertise. So many volunteers come with their experiences, we get telephone calls all the time, Oh, you designed this, can we do it this way? Oh, you told us to use these nails, we can't find them. So we have this experience of thousands of people coming together, um, which is truly something that a lot of organizations don't have. This first slide is a picture taken from the airplane coming into San Juan two years ago. This is two months after the earthquake. All over you see these blue tops covering these buildings. If you fly into San Juan, you basically see the same thing now. There are still about 30, estimated 30,000 buildings with blue tops on them. Yes, the, de the debris on the ground is cleared up, but even now in the recent days, a lot of people are losing what they have in their houses. So there's a lot of work to be done. When we look at nature, on the other hand, the above picture was taken two months after the hurricane, um, and it looked even worse right after the hurricane. You see the trees up here. Not only were leaves slipped off of them, but entire branches, entire trees got let down. This is already starting to look green, but right after the hurricane, there weren't even any leaves left on the ground. Two years later, this is what we see. Trees are back, full foliage, blooming, looks beautiful, looks like a tropical paradise. So something I've been thinking a lot about later, and I'd love I can talk, think about this for hours, is what is the difference here between nature and what we humans do? For nature, I think hurricanes are God's way of giving the creation a haircut every once in a while. It happens every few years. It's been doing that for millions of years. Nature's adopted to that, and this is just part of the routine. Um, you know, we have a volcano. Is that a natural disaster, or is that what kind of disaster is that? Well, without volcanoes, we wouldn't have beautiful mountains to climb. We wouldn't have fertile slopes to grow our coffee on. No, volcanoes are not a disaster. It's just a part of nature. Um, flooding that comes down the Mississippi to destroy entire towns and put MDS people to work. Well, is that a disaster or not? Well, without those floods, we wouldn't have farmland to grow our corn. That's just a part of nature. So, what is a disaster to us? It's a natural phenomenon to nature. And so, for me, it's like, 
hey, what is our role in this? What are we doing wrong that it is such a disaster for us? So this is what was left after the hurricane. We see some buildings built out of concrete, which are still in good shape. Um, if I was to build a house for myself, that would be out of concrete. If the concrete's heavy enough, it's not going to fly away. Um, but anything built with wood basically got destroyed. Um, what was the problem there? Is it because people didn't have the knowledge to do it, perhaps? Or they didn't have the resources to build it properly? And the statistic that's been thrown around is with tornadoes in this country. Tornadoes basically have a small funnel with high winds, maybe usually 100 feet across, maybe up to a quarter of a mile across. Why is it that we have damage for three miles an hour? And it's estimated that 90% of the buildings that get destroyed by tornadoes were outside of the design speed limit that houses are supposed to be designed for or built to. So it's because people are not building to code. Um, contractors maybe don't have the means or don't have the knowledge to build properly. Because I've seen pictures where hurricanes have gone through towns in Florida where whole neighborhoods have been devastated. And then they'll show in the middle there'll be five houses standing. Well, those were the ones built by Habitat for Humanity or by MBS. Those were built by codes, those were built by contracts and people that were conscientious of building and collecting. So again, is this a natural disaster? Is this a human-made disaster? So, what I really see as a big part of our role in MDS is helping other people to build properly for these conditions. Um, we can't keep sending volunteers to every disaster all over the country every five years to rebuild what was done. And so, there's about 70 different volunteer, uh, volunteer agencies in Puerto Rico that receive funding from FEMA to repair roofs, about 5,000 bucks per house or so. And so FEMA looked around and they saw the work that MDS was doing and said, let's share this knowledge with other organizations. And they asked us to give workshops to do this. Who do we give these workshops for? This is uh, my name, Lorenzo, who we worked with a couple weeks ago. She started an organization right after the hurricane. Um, she just stopped what she was doing, started fundraising, and got this group of people together in her hometown. Of the organizations, the traditional organizations that we give workshops to, like church groups or relief agencies, it's an interesting observation that all of those are headed by men, kind of the traditional hierarchy. I think all the organizations that we work with that got started after the hurricane were started by and directed by women such as Samaria. Just an interesting observation here. Um, we've given, what, eight workshops since February, and they won a lot more. But to lots of different places, like here, one was at the Academia Menonita in San Juan. Um, these were put on in a local community center. Um, the last one was um, put on by a Mormon church, but they couldn't hold it in the Mormon church, so an adjacent plantain packing plant said, oh, you come use our place. Um, this was with a Catholic organization, this one was in schools. So just a lot of different places. Who comes to these? A lot of them in some places are just weekend volunteers that work with local volunteers that work with organizations. Um, here we have people from the local municipality, the local government, where the government is doing repair work. We have contractors coming from them. We have individual homeowners that come just to find out how to do repair work. The workshops are one day long, and uh, the morning we give a presentation of how things got damaged during the earthquake. What are the mechanisms of failure? Um, and then we give some theory on that happened. How do we go about paying things better? And then in the afternoon we do a workshop. So I just
just want to give a few slides of what we show in the morning to give a, a feeling of what goes on. Um, we start with talking about the hurricane, 180 miles per hour wind. Um, when you're driving in your car at 55, 60 miles an hour and you hit a tree, you know what kind of damage you get. Um, damage or energy increases by the square of the velocity. So 180 squared divided by 60 squared, I think that's about nine times as common. Just to give you some idea of the strength of these winds. Here in Virginia, we need to design for a wind speed of 115 miles per hour. Um, you notice sometimes we have a wind of 70 miles coming through, like I did that show a few years ago, and a lot of things got damaged. Well, if the design speed is 150, why are things getting damaged when the wind speed isn't even close to 150? Um, the force of winds here compared to the force of what this is design for here is about three times stronger, just to give you some idea. Um, and the weight, weights we have to deal with here for snow down about 30 pounds a square foot. Here we have, in Puerto Rico, we have to deal with forces three times higher than that upwards. We look at just how things have failed each of the components. Um, how the sheet metal was put down, were there enough screws, enough nails, were the sizes of the deck, was the spacing enough? The nails for that, were they installed properly? Um, how were they installed? You see on the other side, we don't have uh, rafters. Why did those rafters get pulled up? We look at how things were attached to the concrete foundations, the floors below, um, you know, the base plates, why were they ripped off of the bolts, um, were the heads of the bolts too small, were the bolts inadequate, um, weren't there enough of them, why did this wall here get, why is the wall gone where parts of the ceiling are still there, um, why did it just get sucked out of the building or pushed into the building. Um, here's the school building in Britannia, uh, Academia Melanita. Um, a really good looking building built out of reinforced concrete. And the roof is lying beside it. And that's metal roof, steel beams. What happened here that a whole roof of this building could get just lifted up and put down in the forest below. Um, when we look at the building from above, we have really strong concrete walls, but you see nothing the meaning of the roof itself. And I love this picture here because we're all standing around. What happened? Um, we thought we had a good building. And it's interesting, the director of the school at that time, we were overlooking the school and he pointed at, oh, you see that building there and there and there? Those all have roofs. Those were built by Puerto Rican contractors. See those buildings over there, that one, that one, that one, without roofs? Those were built by North American volunteers. And so what happened here? Well, in Virginia, like we said, we have snow loads. That's a heavy load going down. We are ready for four or five feet of snow pushing down on our buildings. We know how to put a post underneath it to keep it up. Um, what we don't have here is the winds pulling up. So to have volunteers and contractors coming from here to build down there, we have no concept of hurricane forces. It's a natural, that is a human disaster. That's not a natural disaster. And while I was there at the school, there were volunteers rebuilding wooden roofs in the same exact way that they got torn off. So what are we learning here? How is our knowledge being passed on? Not only to our own volunteers, but to other volunteers or to local people. <coughs> And basically, the concrete construction that I saw in Puerto Rico was well done, like commercial buildings, buildings for people that had money to do correctly. Um, yes, they suffered water damage, because how do you prevent water from coming through windows where it's being driven at 180 miles per hour um, horizontally? You basically have to live in a fish tank to 
keep that kind of one out. But the structures were good. Um, I forgot to mention these workshops and are geared towards wooden roofs and wooden structures. We did not deal with concrete buildings at all. And basically because the work that volunteer organizations are doing is for people that didn't have enough money to build correctly. So it's more the lower income houses that have wooden roofs. The more um, financially equipped people could build out of concrete and they didn't need our services. And like in the case of this one here, we go into all the details. You know, here, a steel bar just got torn apart. You can see the jagged edge. Here, the beam just got torn off of the anchor bolts coming out of the wall. In this case, even the beam itself got ripped out of the well. We look at the wind forces, how wind comes over the building. Um, basically, building is like an airplane wing. Um, the wind comes over it. The building is supposed to go up into the air unless you tie it down. And what are the forces there that we have to counter? What are the forces of wind coming in, in through the windows and doors and pushing outwards and sucking outwards? The wind also wants to push over your house. The, the roof has to be adequately tied to the walls. The wall has to be adequately tied to the foundation so it doesn't get We look at each of the details, what kind of connectors do we need for that force to get transmitted from each connector down to the walls, down to the beams, down to the foundations. If one of those connectors is missing, this building is going to fly away. Um, here we nail everything together, nails are not adequate there. We need a metal tie for every piece of wood all the way from the top to the bottom. And that is something that contractors do not have experience with. Um, we show a lot of photographs of the pair work that we are seeing organizations doing that show what's right or wrong about it. I'm going to really say this is not just a presentation, this is a, an exchange. Um, we use examples of everybody to talk about everything. And each one comes up with a better detail or talks about their details. So it's a collaborative thing. Like in here in this case, no, you do not use drywall nails to put in hangers. Drywall nails are going to rust because they're going into pressure treated wood. And they also don't have the force of nails. Um, in this case, something we don't do here, but we put a strap over the bridge beam to keep those staffs in place. show an example of a front porch car. Um, basically, every front porch for overhanging hanging roof are torn off during the right here. Just as an example, the uh, wind force on that little car is 2,500 pounds pushing up. 2,500 pounds, that's weight in that small lander that we go for the church this morning. Except that's the force up. So how do we resist that force? We look at different connectors that are being used, how they're inadequate, and then what has to be done. And sometimes, like the connectors that we need aren't even still there. So we'll show an example later of this connector that isn't that we can't find in Puerto Rico, but what can people do to use the materials that they can find? Um, then we have, have handouts that describe for each level of the construction. How do you put in your trusses or your rafters? How do you attach your plywood? What kind of roofing paper or ice water shield kind of protective coating do we put over that? How do you attach the corrugated roofing or the galvanic roofing or the nails and screw spacings? What size do you use? Kevin mentioned also earthquakes. Um, <coughs> This is Puerto Rico here, and it's part of what's called the Caribbean plate, which is a whole plate um, that goes around the Caribbean. It goes from Puerto Rico through Haiti, comes over, goes to Guatemala, Salvador, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, 
all these items. And that's a very high seismic zone. So years ago, we had that earthquake in Haiti. Um, Puerto Rico lies in the same earthquake zone and has a potential for the same kind of earthquake. In Haiti, they didn't have an earthquake for 200 years. 200 years, Puerto Rico had an earthquake even stronger than the one that they had in Haiti. Um, this one 100 years ago was about the same strength. Um, these are about 100 years apart, so there's the next one coming in L2, I think. You know, the anniversary of that 100 one was last year. When is this next one going to happen? Um, so the question comes, we can't only build for high planes. Like the big issue in Haiti was they have all these big concrete buildings which were wonderful to protect them against hurricanes. Once we had the earthquake, they all fell down. So here we have a building built out of concrete, a block. Um, and these folks said they wanted a place to swim roof with the concrete roof. We don't want our roof to fly away again. This makes, uh, makes sense to me. But this building is located on the side of the mountain. And on one side it's sitting on the mountain, and on the other side it's on columns. And you'll see thousands of houses like this in Quebec. Some you can tell are well made, but the majority are not. Um, so why not put one there? Well, do these concrete columns meet the seismic design requirements? I can't tell. What kind of footings are they on? Probably an <coughs> It's on the side of a hill. If we have a hurricane, water and uh, seismic event at the same time. This is just going to have a landslide and the whole thing goes down. So do we want to put a nice concrete roof on them to protect them against the hurricane, just to kill them tomorrow when the building falls down um, with an earthquake? So that's why we're putting wooden roofs back on a lot of these houses instead of concrete ones. <coughs> um, a fun part is always to talk about volunteers, we get a lot of input from this. Here we have this bag attack loop, you might recognize some of them. There we have Earl, and there we have Miguel, there's some characters over there. Um, what do you do with them when they show up at the job site? Okay, they're good for painting. Let's make things pretty. Paint is the same here as it is over there, and it looks beautiful. Um, my wife Sue had a wonderful sense of accomplishment at the end of that week. This is Lian, um, so you might know if you all start. And then they're good for just chatting with people, joking it out, having a good time. And that is important. We can't just go down there and do bricks and mortar. Um, people need encouragement, and that friendship is really important. And I think volunteers are wonderful doing that. But when it comes to work, um, people coming from here, whether it's volunteers or contractors, whatever, we need to be working on the people that are qualified and are knowledgeable about the hurricane and the seismic conditions. So not only do we need to train other organizations, it's how do we pass this knowledge on to other people going down with MDS. Um, I think we're in a really good place to do that. And this also means then training the local Puerto Ricans on how to do this. Because MDS project managers go down there for a month at a time, but if they don't have experience there, somebody needs to pass on the knowledge. And I think Kevin, you said that's the same issue when we send volunteers down to Texas. They need to follow an MDS design, which is really being thought through for hiking conditions, and not just do what they do. Um, then after the morning session of uh, talking, we always have lunch, that's an important part for me of course. But here there's a woman, Julia, um, and I want you to remember Julia. She showed up that morning and all she wanted to talk about was the rain that the previous week had destroyed her house again. She had lost the roof two years ago from the earthquake, from the hurricane. It got rebuilt twice by local workers, and every time it fails. And this time again, her blue top got ripped off, and she lost everything that she had. So she came to this as a homeowner. I want to learn how to do this right, so the next time people come to my house, I can point out all the things they need to be doing. So that's Julia. <coughs> we start off by how do we anchor 
anchor the word into the, into the concrete. And this is the Simpson dealer for Puerto Rico. You in the construction business know that Simpson, they provide most of the hangers that are used to hold wood and just about anything together in the construction industry. And I called him up and said, hey, can't you donate material for these workshops? And he's not doing that. He just says, come to, your, come to our warehouse with your list, we'll give you what you want. So I said, well, why don't you come and demonstrate? So he showed up and he did the demonstration. And he said he wants to come to every one of these now and bring the material and do the demonstration himself. Then we go about just building a small model. Um, all the wood is pre-cut in the morning by Jackie or whoever else is there <laughs> to get it all ready. So all we're doing is naming everything together, fasting it. And um, remember Julia, she's there with a camera taking pictures exactly of everything to show the folks how to do it. Um, here, how do you nail plywood? Every four inches on center, what's four inches? Well, you put one nail in, and you put out your foot, your hand, yeah, it's about four inches from there to there. Um, get a good visual effect for that. Then we start putting up the walls. There's Julia with the camera. One wall after another. There's Julia with the camera again. How do you nail the corner? I'm here. Remember the post um, where we didn't have the attachment we needed? Well, we've done some calculations and you can use the post that they find locally, but you just add a slap to it, wrap it down, add a few more nails, and it gives us strength uh, that's needed. And how do you put on your rafters? Um, how do you put on your siding? And finally, how do you put on the metal thing? And again, Kevin, you might not have seen this detail yet, but usually there's another piece of metal that goes over the edge of the roofing and all is stuck together and the wind comes and kind of tears it all apart. Well, this was local contribution. They said, well, we just take that roofing, we bend it over and then screw it in over here so we don't have anything flapping around. And that's about as strong as you can get. So it's always fun for people to put their own input, and every show we give is a little bit different because we've always changed one detail from something the previous one. And a big deal at the end is always signing, and here's Miriam, remember Miriam, who started Spong and Maria. Um, they're all happy, everybody takes pictures of each other, and has a good time building it. And then this is either used as a small children's playhouse, chicken coop or a little shed and they sort of stuff in. So that's it for the workshops. Um, this is your Puerto Rican crew. You've met Rolando already previously. Here's Dimitrio Chilo, who some of you might have met. Here we made the pictures at the relief sale um, last year. He's coming this year again, so be sure to show up and buy pictures from him. Um, Tony, He's um, the uh, MDS helps him for the work there. He does a lot of the organization for projects in policy. And Chilo for me has been invaluable. He kind of went through a presentation at the beginning to really Puerto Ricanize it. Um, the Spanish in Puerto Rico, oh, by the way, these slides are all given in Spanish. This is just the English version that we put together because some of our participants come from organizations like Ivan or so, they don't speak Spanish, so we have two versions, we give them one in English. So he, he really went, helped us with Puerto Rican Spanish, which is totally different than Nicaraguan Spanish, um, and helps us get the TL and just organizes these things. Um, this is the Nereida who we will be building a house for in a week from now. And here's Jackie Zook, and she will follow me now and give a little presentation of one of our last workshops. Yeah, as Johan said, my name is Jackie Zook, and I just started working for Johan back in March. And by May, he was already tired of me, and he takes me out to Puerto Rico for three weeks. <laughs> so that first week, uh, I went down ahead of Sam and Johan, they joined me for the last two weeks, actually. But the first
first week I always volunteered with MBS down in Ponce with Chiro and, and Tony and I was actually the only MBS volunteer that week um, so I was by myself um, working with Tony and two other younger guys who really didn't have much construction experience and we were supposed to lift up these 26 foot long wooden trusses onto a roof and there were about 20 of them we really didn't have the capability of doing that. Um, so one of the really neat things about what's going on in Puerto Rico right now is it's not just MDS doing this work, there's other organizations um, and there's even local organizations and so there's this group called AMPI, They're, it's about six or seven um, Puerto Rican guys that are working on the west coast really trying to change their community, this is the community that they're working in actually. But they mainly get their funds from FEMA, and sometimes it's really not enough to do all the work that they want to be doing. But MPS has a lot of wood, and so there's kind of this interchange of um, this Puerto Rican crew will come over and help MPS sometimes when there's no volunteers, they'll volunteer their time and their labor. In exchange, MPS will give them wood for them to go off and build uh, roofs and, and houses. So it's not just about one organization trying to do it all, but they're working together. So I got to meet um, this crew from the West Coast, um, and man, they made it. They, they, they just worked so hard. Within, within a day, they had all those trusses up on the roof we were working on. The next day, they had three quarter inch wet, really heavy plywood up on the roof. I mean, it wasn't their house or their community they were working for, but they still worked hard. So it was just a pleasure working with them for those two days, that first week I was down in Puerto Rico. Well, come to find out, that actually was the crew that the following week, Johan, my coworker Sam, and I were going to help train. Uh, we were going to do a week-long workshop on how to build trusses and how to put them on roofs. So we went over to the West Coast the second week I was in Puerto Rico, and we started working with this crew. Well, the first day, as we came to this building, and um, it's a concrete building, but it had its wooden roof blown off. Um, we start learning about what this community is like that these guys have been working in. And previously, uh, this community was known for drugs, for violence. There were deaths reported every year. Um, but as this crew has come in and started working and um, helping to put roofs back on these homes, um, the community has really started to shift. There's, um, there's hardly any deaths reported in the community anymore. They're really working not to have drugs there anymore. Um, so really, uh, this, this crew has, um, and has really been affecting this community. Um, and in particular, there's one guy that we were working with that we really started to get to know, his name is Brian. And Brian is an example of who is coming out of this community. Brian um, didn't finish high school. He actually, uh, I think he was involved in an alcohol influenced um, violence act, and so he went to jail for a few years. And then when he got out, he wanted to shift his life around, but he didn't really have any work. We started seeing this crew coming in and, and putting roofs back on in the community, and he said, man, I want to join that. So we actually walked up to them and he said, hey, can I have a job? I'm going to join you. And the crew said, yeah, come, come join us. Even though we didn't have any construction experience, they took him on and they started training him. Well, Brian's never owned a house, but these four walls were owned by someone in his family, and so he bought it from him, and so as, as we were going to talk with him, we found out this was actually going to be Brian's first house. We were going to be working on the first house he would ever own. He has, a, he has a wife and a few kids, but he doesn't have a house. And honestly, that was just such a neat experience throughout the week, getting to work with Brian and his crew. They were just all so excited that Brian was going to get his first house, and, and, and you can even see the, the hope that Brian had life. Um, we were talking with the lady who kind of runs the crew and she was saying that now Brian just has hope and he, he 
wants to go back to church, he wants to turn his life around, and he's just so excited. Um, even as we were making decisions about the house and getting to ask Brian what he wants and how he wants it done, there's just a dedication in him and in the crew to do it right and, and to learn well. Um, so we spent the week getting to know Brian and the, and the crew. Um, so basically for that week-long workshop that we did, we started from um, step one and the house we were working on was not square at all. I think one side was 17 foot long and the other would be like 20, 23 foot. And then I think one side was 26 and the other was 31. It, it was, who made a house like this, you know? <laughs> so we had to teach them, all right, when you have an unsquare house, how do you put trusses on there to make it easier for you? And, um, so we did a lot of theory work as well as actual construction work. So we, we wanted to take the time to show them how to do it right and why you do what you do. Uh, so this is Johan here writing numbers on the wall and teaching them how to do a right triangle. Uh, that's, that's Brian. So then throughout the week then we started teaching them how to make a, a jig pattern for trusses. Um, and then eventually we got them all up. And there, there's Brian again. Um, and then every, for every step we would go back and just explain to them why are we doing what we're doing. Um, at this point we have our trusses up and now we're moving into the plywood and the, the water shield and, and the metal and so why do we need um, that plywood? Why do we need um, to put so many nails and, and screws in? What's the point of using all of this material? Um, and, and the guys really were engaged and really wanted to know it. They wanted to do it right. Um, so this is the crew putting on the, the ice and water shield on top of the plywood of the house. Um, yeah, that's Brian. That's Miguel, the leader. Yeah, and then eventually we have this house, and what was really neat, um, it was fun getting to work with this crew. Johan and I actually went down to Puerto Rico a couple weeks ago, and we ran into Miguel, the, the leader of the crew. Um, well, he was actually helping us with one of the workshops to cut up the wood. But he said they just got a roof done in two days with doing all the trusses and the plywood and, and the water shield and the, and the metal. So they, they took what they learned during that week, and they're just really applying it. And yeah, just that eagerness to help their community. Um, so it, um, I've just really appreciated the chance to be able to go down there and honestly learn from these guys as well as try and um, teach them how to help their community. So it's been an honor and a privilege to be working down there. Thank you, Jackie. And now we'll open it up for questions. Can you, can you read the word, the name brand of that cover on there? How many of you noticed that? I think it's really appropriate name that we're covering these homes with grace. How appropriate. Uh, and as Jackie mentioned, this collaboration of learning from each other back and forth uh, is very key for our MDS work. Are there questions, comments? I'd much rather answer questions than hear myself talk all the morning. Is Mark Nisley here? There's a couple of folks I want. Yes, over here is Mark. There's a number of folks that were just so key. Uh, there was a driver, John, John Driver, was also helpful in Puerto Rico. Some of these folks we pulled out the woodwork and said, you know Spanish, you know Puerto Rico, would you go for us? These, were, these folks were clutch. So thank you, Mark, and many others as well. I made, and it is making this uh, program possible. Uh, I can't state it enough, it's an island. Duh. But to get there back and forth and getting resources is, has been always a challenge. In Texas, or a Hurricane Harvey, or Irma in Florida, or on, I mean, if you're crazy enough, you can drive for 24 hours and you can deliver the supplies. But on an island, it takes time, it takes resources. Questions? Are there local codes on the island that would require the kind of engineering things you're, you're wanting to teach them? So the question was, are there codes on the island that would require teaching them? Um, Puerto Rico is a bad boy, and it's 
has the same codes that we have here on the mainland. Um, it's governed by the same codes. Who enforces that is the issue. So when it comes to commercial construction, that, that what I've seen is very good. But locally, you do not have inspectors. You have a building department, but every construction needs to have either an engineer or an architect on the job. <coughs> they are the ones that need to do the inspection. Um, so like the buildings we're working on, I would say 99.9% were not built with a building permit. And we're not built to codes. But supposedly they're supposed to be built by codes. So that's also a tricky line for MDS. How far can we go with that? We need to have a local engineer on each project. But when does that kick in? We can repair roofs without that, but when it comes to entire buildings, we need a local person. On our plans, I always put, we need a local engineer, and what happens to that? I don't know. That is an issue. Yesterday in our church, we heard a quip that seems to have potential. FEMA, they said, really stands for Find Every Mennonite Available. <laughs> On a serious note, uh, an economic question. You heard in news recently something about shipping regulations that place Puerto Rico at a disadvantage. Ships from other nations cannot down, cannot unload at, in Puerto Rico without first unloading in a U.S. Uh, port. Is that? Uh, do you have any information? But again, yes, the U.S. often looks out for its own interest, whether it's international relief aid. Uh, USA tries to ship our own product. So it has to be American products rather than using local resources. So that's often very much a disadvantage when we could be using local resources and stimulate the local economy. As a segue to that, I often say in times of disaster, even like the Bahamas, people want to say, oh, those dear folks, they don't have any clothes, let's send clothes, or let's send water, or, and I often say, please do not send stuff. Cash is always best. So if you could help us get that message out, cash, I often say, you don't have to warehouse it, you don't have to ship it, you don't have to inventory it, and it stimulates the local economy. In Hurricane Sandy, for example, that hit North, uh, New York City, I was there in Staten Island, and locally, people were, trucks were coming in from Ohio bringing pickup loads of water to Hurricane Sandy. Just six blocks up the street was a grocery store that they could buy water. So it's all good intentions, but shipping stuff too, and is often the second disaster. In Hurricane Harvey, over 70% of the aid sat there and had to be disposed of later. So uh, I can't stress that enough. Of, unless specifically requested by an organization, do not ship stuff. I'm saying it the nice way. Just want to add something there. Um, I find Puerto Rico to be very technologically isolated. Um, there's a lot of building techniques that I see in Central America, Nicaragua, Guatemala, that you do not see in Puerto Rico because there's not that interchange between the local countries. All the traffic comes from the US, and like these ships can come in. Um, while we were building, for instance, there was a shortage of steel roofing. Well, the French have tons of it sitting offshore, but they can't come and use the harbor. Um, building techniques in Nicaragua, which is very high gain resistant and um, earthquake resistant, has not found its way yet to Puerto Rico. And that's one thing we wanted to experiment with right away, bring that in. But we found that if we bring in these new technologies, we have to be there to train people to do it. And so we haven't gone that route at the moment. Another thing is material price. Um, Jackie and I went to a place, basically we wanted some roofing material. And the guy wanted to charge us $28 for a roll of roofing paper. I said, no, I don't pay more than 12 bucks for a roll of roofing paper. You 
they bring us off. And I got out my smartphone at the Home Depot place. See, here it costs 12 bucks at uh, Home Depot. Won't you give it to me at that price? And then Jackie, my IT agent, she comes over and says, no, that's the Home Depot in house. Look at the local one. <laughs> and the local one is 20, $28. Dollars. So $28 for something we buy $12 a year for. Certainly some of that is a shipping cost, but also because I was told that because FEMA is paying for a lot of this reconstruction stuff, all the prices are being generated. And these are the same US companies that we have here. Yeah, I um, was just amazed that throughout the whole um, talk, I haven't heard anything about money. You know, lots of times when you do things like this, you hear about, well, we wanted to do it this way or that way, but then we didn't have the money, so then we had to, you know, try to figure out how to get the money. And it seems to me that even organizations like SWAP have some problems with that. But, um, you know, I just, it, it amazed me that money wasn't mentioned as an obstacle. That money was not an obstacle. That's fair. I, I marvel at the generosity of our people. MDS is blessed. We don't have a development. I'm not slamming any other organization. Can I say that? I'm, please hear me. We don't have, well, we have one development officer in our office. But a key thing, John Lapp, Executive Secretary of MCC once said of MDS. The key principle of MDS is, Kevin, I was once bemoaning that we, did, we didn't have fundraisers and all that. He said, no. The secret to MDS is once you tell the congregations your barns are empty, churches will respond. I have seen that. It's an overwhelming sense of generosity to say, we want to help. Okay, I can't go, but I'll give. And so we're blessed with that. Yes, at times you may hear us say we need help, and we do. That will be genuine. But I thank you as a congregation here in the valley for your generosity. Foundations are reaching out and learning about MDS. Um, from Toyota Foundation to the Margaret A. Cargill Foundation to Michael and Susan Dale Foundation. A week after I came back from Hurricane Harvey, I got a phone call. Some of you heard me tell this story. Dell Foundation makes Dell computers. This lady called me up and said, is this Kevin? Yes. Are you with the Mennonites? Yes. She said, I'm with the Dell Foundation. We have $36 million for Hurricane Harvey. How much do you need? <laughs> what would you say? First of all, how did you get my number and how do you, oh, she said, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. King, she said, a friend of mine works for uh, the foundation in New York City during Hurricane Sandy. I said, oh, yes, we know them. We were, yes, she called me and said, you call the Mennonites, they're the best. <laughs> so, uh, of course, actually, I told her we didn't need anything right away during the early response because I said, if we take your money, You'll deprive our congregation from giving and being a blessing. Oh, she said, isn't that novel? <laughs> then I went on to describe before she hung up on me how we have long-term recovery. That we'll be there for two and five and six years rebuilding. This is when it takes lots of funds. After 20 minutes, she finally said, can you send this to me in writing? <laughs> so that's the kind of blessing. Sorry, I really went off. Yeah. I spent a couple of uh, weeks last year in Wisconsin. I was wondering how that, pro how that the project was going along. I had a great time with uh, Sebastian and Dave. You remember them from Ruderhoff Weiss? Yes. Utuwaka, you said. Where did you say? Yeah. Utuwaka, yes. We'll be the, we are we are all starting up again this fall in Utuwaka and in Ponce, so the north central of the highlands. I will need to, has been kind of the Goshen or the Lancaster Mecca 
And so we're moving out of that into the highlands of Utuato, and we'll continue to responding now down into the city. Many of these roofs that Johan said, 30,000 roofs yet. So we're going to focus on those two areas of roof repair and roof repair in Ponce. Ponce has just been an amazing model. Chido and Levy, this couple that's coming to the relief sale again, get to know them. They said, this model of MDS is beautiful. In fact, we can do this. And so we're sending volunteers, and then they're coordinating the response. So it's been a fun model. Is the church complete now, though? Yes, the church, uh, Pastor Deborah, the church and the, the parsonage is finished. It's beautiful. And they're just so grateful to MDS's response. I think Earl, you worked on that, and a couple other people. Sue, you had a comment. Thank you. I have two comments. I wanted to respond to your comment, Sally. I think what's different between MDS, say, and what some of the other Mennonite organizations is uh, an emergency pulls at our heartstrings. And so then that we're wanting to give something immediately because of the emergency and how it's portrayed in the media, etc. So that's wonderful to take advantage of that. And I want to thank Jackie for being part of the team um, and showing that women can do this as well, both American women and Puerto Rican or anywhere else. And I think that's just awesome that you're part of the team. Uh, Earl Martin here. Uh, I'm curious, uh, given the credibility of MDS in our country and other areas, um, and given the situation we're facing with climate crisis, I'm wondering if uh, uh, how MDS sees itself uh, now in, uh, with respect to advocacy on uh, climate crisis mitigation. Uh, because we're on the front lines on that. And uh, is it uh, possible or is it happening that MDS is using its voice to speak to the issues of fossil fuel use and things like that so that we have uh, fewer of these extreme uh, kind of weather situations. Uh, is this part of the Ministry of MDS or will it be or can it be? I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. Well, you, you all are MDS, so we want to listen to the voices of the constituents. Uh, we don't see ourselves starting an advocacy branch within MDS, but I think in the practices, in the praxis of how we build back in mitigation and stronger. For example, next week I'm in being invited up to Anchorage, Alaska, where they had an earthquake to talk about uh, mitigating, you know, the seismic. FEMA's inviting MDS to go up there and talk with city and state officials about mitigating earthquakes there and how do we build that. So I think it's in the praxis where we haven't done well yet, perhaps, and maybe it's a question, should we? is in the advocacy, talk about climate change. Honestly, MDS's tent is pretty wide. Our constituents, it's about this wide. I guarantee you, I get a better reception talking about climate change in this, under this roof, than it would some other churches. As about as far as I get would be to say the climate is changing. And people would shake their heads because I could give the illustration. 15 years ago, we'd have two and three disasters. Now there's 15 to 18 to 20. Okay, the giant claimant. Where we disagree on is, is it human caused or is nature caused? There's where we break down. But it's in our practice of mitigation, elevation. Rodney Burkholder here is with MDS here in the Shenandoah Valley, going back and forth to West Virginia the homes that we're building and getting them out of the floodplain and putting them up on higher ground. And it's in the practice that we respond. So, Earl, that's, I don't know. I don't know, but that's the practice of it. <coughs> in 
responding, of mitigating. In Texas, we are uh, rebuilding another community in uh, Bloomington. Uh, 30 homes are being taken out of the floodplain, and the Amish are being bused from Holmes County down to build these houses, and uh, a number of groups are coming together to rebuild there out of the floodplain. So uh, I am much more keen about that as to how we build back. I think, uh, Phil, you had a word here. I was just going to say that one of our challenges, you indicated money was you indicated money was not necessarily our challenge, but one of our challenges is to identify enough leaders uh, to lead projects, whether it be in Puerto Rico or uh, here in the U.S. and Canada. Absolutely. I'm going to say that again. So the weakest link in MDS is leadership. We need more office managers. We need more cooks. We need more construction supervisors like Jackie and John, Anthony, close. Um, <laughs> we need more crew leaders that could come for a month or more. And we'll pay your way to and from uh, transportation. And we'll pay, train you. And we'll mentor you, put you alongside of people. That is our weakest link in MDS. This fall, we're opening 16 locations or going back to many of them. That's unprecedented. We've never had that many locations throughout US and Canada, all the way from Saipan to California fires, to Texas hurricanes, to Florida, to now the Florence and, uh, and Matthew and Michael in the Panhandle, <coughs> West Virginia. Last week, two weeks ago, I was in, uh, where was I? British Columbia. Uh, so, Canada. So we have quite a number of projects that we need leadership. Short-term volunteers are coming, and there's some weeks there too. But as you go back to your congregations, as you go back to your homes, uh, go online, poke, prod, pinch, grab some people, and sign up for MPS for a week. You don't have to be a skilled carpenter. If you have two hands and two feet, we'll make you tired before the day's over. <laughs> And we'll match you with a skilled volunteer. Erwin, what's your skill with construction? You can do about anything, but if we had to lay tile, we'll put... You can do tile. We can put you with somebody else. Or if you had to do electrical work, we'll put you in a team. And we need Erwin. Put him on my list. Put him on Phil, get him on the list. I think we're about out of time. I've heard it. Are you saying that if Erwin can do it, anybody can do it? That's right. Inspiring how many of you have been there uh, yourself. 